Hi, everyone. Welcome back. This is the second segment in stage two on API product and community. Our next speaker is Rob Dickinson, CTO and co-founder of Resurface Labs. Hi, Rob. How are you doing today? Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Uh, it sounds like an interesting topic as to uh, why we should shift from the triage mode. Yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. At a time when a lot of us, for a lot of different reasons, are living in triage mode, um, how to how to break free of that cycle and, and actually do a turnaround and, and have some fun in the process. Perfect. So looking forward to it. Are you ready? Let's do it. Perfect. Over to you. All right. Thanks so much. So very glad to be here. Uh, I'm Rob Dickinson. I'm CTO at Resurface Labs, and I'm, I'm easy to find online. Uh, I am a developer uh, by training and at heart. Um, so the material I'm going to be presenting here today is very much from that API developer perspective. And why, why should you care about what I think or what I have to say? I've, I've had some successful project of, projects. I've worked at some large companies like Intel and Dell. And I've also seen some other projects that maybe didn't go quite as well. And I think there's a lot of lessons there to learn kind of from, from both sides of that, um, that perspective. So what we're going to talk about here today is um, mostly around the, the culture and the technical expressions of what turnarounds actually look like, what the challenge of being stuck in the need for a turnaround, how to figure out when you're in that territory, and then how to, how to get back out of it. So give you some, some very concrete coping strategies and some best practices, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. And free, please uh, feel free to post your questions in the live chat, and then that gives us uh, some, some good stuff to talk about at the end. All right, so in terms of framing the problem, uh, you know, as, as a developer myself, you know, what do developers like the most? We, we like to start from scratch. We like to start from a, a greenfield project where anything is possible, haven't made any mistakes yet, um, right? And, and so much of what we, we idolize in, in development is creating new things. And that's great, creating new APIs. Certainly, there's there's a lot of that, and it's it's very exciting. You know, starting from scratch is always a lot of fun. You know, we we all know that. But unless you're really only doing greenfield development, you probably always you're not always going to be there from the very beginning. And in terms of if you're going to have a career in this industry, you're you're actually going to see a lot of these kinds of cases too. You might go to a new employer and you weren't there from the start of the project that was there and you're you're inheriting these APIs you're you're going to be on the team that that takes those over could be a new team assignment within the same employer it could be you're getting promoted into a new position it could be an acquisition a merger it could be a vendor change it could be something that used to be provided by another vendor you're moving in house or vice versa or you're switching things up could be some other kind of directional change or strategic change for the firm that just changes everything about what you're doing. I would argue that over a long enough time span, you'll find yourself in more of those situations as a developer than actually starting from scratch. It's not to say you won't have great chances to start from scratch, but a lot of times in your career, you're gonna find out that there already is something that's there you need to take it over and and make it better and and move forward with it so this comes up an, an awful lot now sometimes when this happens right away you know that things are bad like it's pretty darn obvious and uh it, and it doesn't really take you know within within days to weeks right you're you're figuring this out that you know th things are not really that healthy and, and we're going to have to do something in a lot of cases, though, it's not that necessarily that obvious. You may be wondering, are things bad enough that we really need to think about some kind of turnaround? Um, and just to define that term, 
you know, turnaround is basically the, the formal process of saying, hey, wait, hang on. We need to change some things to really be able to move forward and to get to where where we need to go. So how do you know if you're if you're in that position? You know, you, you might be arriving in this new position and you're kind of wondering, are things really going as well as they told me during the interview process? You know, are there are there really other kinds of problems going on that maybe they didn't want to admit? Um, you're kind of finding out what's really going on. There are some very clear signals that you can be looking for that will kind of tell you if you might be in turnaround behavior. Um, one of my favorites is if you're actually using your customers to do QA, you know, you're, you're putting out new versions of your APIs and your systems. And if your customers are the ones that are telling you when things are breaking themselves and you're not catching those more proactively, you know, that's, that's a really bad sign. Um, in general, a high rate of defects, things that seem to be fixed, but take a whole bunch of chances to fix them, things that, that just repeatedly come back. That's another really bad sign. Um, random behaviors. Why does it do that? I don't know. There's some kind of race condition or what we call unfixable behaviors, which is, yeah, I know that's a problem, but we can't really do anything about it. It would just it would just be too expensive or take too much time. Um, really bad sign. Um, excessive complexity. And <clears throat> how I would really describe that culturally is if if very few people can reasonably predict how the system is supposed to work and respond, that's a really clear sign of excessive complexity. And you can already see a lot of these things will go hand in hand. If you have excessive complexity, of course, you're going to have a higher rate of defects, a higher rate of regressions. You're going to have more of those negative impacts actually being seen by your end customers and so on. Other things to watch out for, if performance is generally bad or it's, it's highly variable, um, if there's no repeatable processes, if you can't really seem to do things very fluidly, if you have unstable builds, if you have operational issues, if you're having failed migrations, failed upgrades. Now, what you might be thinking is, well, hey, some of that, like, or maybe some of those, you know, definitely sound like my kind of, of, of project or like the kind of thing that I'm working on now. Is it really bad enough that we need to formally say, hey, wait, time out. We, we, need, we need to do a turnaround here. We need to do a retrofit. Um, how, do, how do you know if it's really bad it's when you kind of have all of these things or or you know 80% of the things on this list and they're really systemic. It's not just normal tech debt. It's not just what you can maybe pound down in a couple of sprints. Um, it's really going to take a concerted effort to, to, to get these things under control. The other way that you'll really know um, emotionally and culturally that you might be in a place where you need to do a turnaround is you feel that you're just constantly in triage mode. Every day there's something new. You, you have to you have to put up, put aside the, the thing that was the emergency yesterday and focus on a new emergency. And that just you can get you can get in teams where that kind of behavior like almost takes over. There's never time to take a breath. There's never really time to, to plan the next release. You're just issuing patch after patch after patch um, to, to get a hold of things. And what I love about the gif here with, with Homer Simpson is he's, the, the emotional timbre is, you know, we've got to do something. We've got to do something quickly. And then what does he do? He immediately wants to start rewriting things <laughs> like, he's, like he's doing on the piece of paper there. Very natural reaction as a developer. If things aren't going well, let's start rewriting some stuff. Um, terrible business instinct, but but you can see where it comes from. Triage mode feels bad. Um, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like you're meeting your objectives. It feels like you're being stuck in a very reactive mode. And this idea that we've got to do something, we've got to break out of it. Um, you know that you're there when kind of everybody's sitting around the table kind of agrees like yeah we we kind of it's time to admit it you know we we really got to do something what you have to do though in the process is not just thrash if you're just thrashing you really can make things worse 
very quickly. Um, you can be issuing patches too quickly, lowering your quality. Um, you can just be burning yourselves out emotionally. You can be directionally changing far too often. It's easy to make things worse, and it's because it doesn't feel good. You you will do whatever kind of it takes to to get out of that out of that mode. Um, but here are some concrete cultural things that you can put in place that will help you um, break out of that cycle. Um, some of these, as it turns out, are very easy to describe in terms of anti-patterns. So kind of open with, with some of those. Um, one of the classic ways to take this idea of a turnaround and really run it into a ditch is not to have a very, very clear clearly stated set of goals and metrics around what it is that you're trying to fix and how you're going to measure fixing that thing. You know, our performance is bad. This is the actual operations that we're measuring. This is how long it usually takes to do that operation. This is the kind of improvement that we're looking to make. You need to get down to an extremely specific set of goals and metrics, or you're really at risk of just staying in that triage mode forever. You have to have a North Star that's, that's gonna guide you towards um, what, your, what your new state of the system is gonna look like. Another thing that you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to revisit the assumptions that you have about your customers and your use cases. You have to, a classic way to fail is to take all of the same design ideas that led you to the first place that you ended up and apply exactly the same thinking to what you're doing around your turnaround or your retrofit. It's time to really find out how things are being used, what are the real use cases, and, and how do you get your hands around what that looks like. Kind of in the next classic way to anti-pattern, a way to, to blow up the turnaround is to be really defensive. You know, hey, this thing that we wanna change, it took a long time to build. It was expensive, it was hard. I'm not that excited about changing it. Um, or setting, or the opposite, like where you don't have the original team involved, um, just blame them for everything. Um, we've, we've all seen this happen. It's very natural sometimes to want to do that, um, but it's really unhealthy. What you wanna do instead is you wanna create a culture of openness where people aren't being punished for what they've done in the past or the ideas that they're contributing now, you wanna create a culture where, hey, anything goes. Like now in the turnaround, now is actually the time to entertain all those really creative ideas that maybe weren't getting thrift along the way, or maybe were brought up earlier and just, just didn't really get their, their due. Another classic way to blow up your turnaround is bargaining, which is, well, if we change this about the API, we'll also have to change this about the API um, in order to make the team happy or to have to somehow make the deal happen. You need to take all of this back from your clear goals and your clear metrics. That's gonna be your North Star. Um, that should be something that you don't really have to bargain or politic around if, if you truly have buy-in from the group that, that, that those are really your goals. So far, these are kind of more business culture um, things that can that can damage your turnaround. There's also some very, very classic technical things that you can do to blow up your turnaround. Um, do something really, really big and drastic, like change languages, change stacks, change platforms. Um, feel like you're changing everything. Um, now, sometimes that's absolutely what you have to do. And it's not like that's that's a bad, a bad answer all the time. Um, but that carries with it, you know, the more you change, the more you risk. Um, and you want to stay on, on the right side of that. One of the key things about a turnaround is not changing too much, but changing the things that really need to be changed. Another classic example is, well, this thing is failing anyway, let's, let's pick some tech that is going to look good on our resume for the next project we looked at. Um, a lot of people do make their choices that way, but it's it's a not a great way to, to to run your turnaround. Refactoring as a way of learning the code base, generally not a great idea. 
Um, you learn the code base by, by learning the code base, not by changing it. Um, you just you don't want to change too much. What I'm going to give you in just the next couple minutes is a really cohesive framework for changing what you need to change and not changing too much and, and actually getting the best um, experience out of this turnaround to which you're going to dedicate significant time and resources and expertise. So and to, prove your, to improve your culture and your vibe, the first thing you need to do is document what you have. Now that sounds backwards. Like we're getting ready to change all this stuff why would we want to document all this stuff? It's, it's through that process of documenting what you have and making sure that you really understand what you have. That's where you're going to realize where your gaps are. Some of those gaps are going to be around your knowledge and your observability of the system. And that's where vendors like Resurface, shameless plug, um, can help you. Um, we can help fill in, you know, if, your system, if you don't know how your systems are actually being used, it's very difficult to modify them in a way that's a net positive, um, certainly in a way to do that quickly. That's even in the best of circumstances. In the worst of circumstances where you really feel like your APIs are melting down, this is the first thing that you have to do is really to understand what you have um, in terms of the components that you can document. And then what are, the, what are your runtime metrics? What, what are your actual performance characteristics your actual quality characteristics. You have to know what it is that you're trying to solve for. Then you can start to rely on real customer patterns. And this is one of the best things about doing a turnaround is you usually have an existing customer base or usage patterns to draw on. And that's awesome. That's the best kind of data. Um, and hopefully your monitoring and logging solutions are providing um, some more of that as well, just like we are. What this allows you to do then culturally is you can incentivize the smallest changes that actually have the biggest impact. And that's what you want to do. You want to really double down on what on what works really, really well. And by saying these are the things that we do really, really well, and we're going to focus on that and we're going to build new things around that vision, you're going to create a new sense of energy in your development team that yeah, we're actually, finally, we're actually doing something about this. This is gonna be great. I'm, I'm so excited to see where this is gonna go. In terms, in terms of improving your tech stack, if it's not about making huge changes, what is it about? It's really about the fundamentals. You wanna sharpen your tools. This is where like, you don't want people, you know, not having the best laptops they can have. It sounds stupid, but like this is something, it's not the time to be hung up on things that you can easily write a check to fix. Get people the gear they need. Fix those gaps in your CI CD pipeline if you have them. Now's the time to do it. You're gonna be making all these changes. You're gonna get back that investment in time very, very quickly. If you have gaps in your test automation, gaps in your deployment automation, gaps in your production runbook. I know, again, let me say it. You're going to be feeling like some of this stuff is mistimed. Aren't we getting ready to change all of this? Why would we be sharpening our tools and documenting all these things? It's because a lot of the stuff that you have now, you're going to be able to carry forward and focus on those parts that are working really, really well. And so sharpening your tools is a way to get on top of that. Then you can get to kind of the next level, which is now I can clone my environment. As soon as I can clone my environment and create my own environment separate from my official staging environment, separate from my official uh, production environment, but my own environment that I can play with, and it's just as good as the real thing, you will cross a huge threshold in terms of how many contributions your team can actually make to the tech stack. Now you can do chaos texting against those clones. It's really hard to justify chaos testing against a real production system when it's failing, right? When things aren't going well. But as soon as you can create those clones, you can really beat them up and do whatever you want to them. It's awesome. Then you can benchmark with those clones. Now you're in a real cadence. Now you're really able to, to just play. You can churn out those new builds, get things out, and try some new experiments. The last thing I want to end with here, super important, is don't forget about security 
as you're going through this whole process. It is exceedingly common that APIs that demonstrate poor performance or poor quality behaviors also treated security, unfortunately, as an afterthought. This is the time where you have to rewind that as well. Get some more, get some of those better security practices in place. Get to your security scanning and production. Start your security champions program if you don't already have one. Because if you skip those risks now, you really skip your, your whole turnaround. You may come back later and say, that thing we really wanted to do technically or that thing that we really wanted to do procedurally, we really can't make it secure enough. If you follow those, some of those basic ideas, you'll find that turnarounds really can be fun. They certainly don't feel fun at the beginning. It feels like you know that things are not going to turn out very well in some circumstances, but through some very, very easy shifts in your culture, you can really get to a point where it's fun, you're back on the right side of it again, and you're able to, to move forward. I'd love to hear um, your questions and your thoughts. Reach me on Twitter. And again, thank you to API Days organizers for uh, for having me. Thanks, Rob. Uh, wonderful. So it's more a culture shift and ownership, yeah, and identifying clear goals with the right metrics, uh, both business and technology. Yeah. So uh, what are the two key challenges um, uh, in bringing the culture shift, in your opinion, like? Uh, based on your experiences? Actually, I, I can give you just the top one. <laughs> um, and, and actually, I wish I had put it in the deck now, but, um, but the top one is if you can frame this change, this turnaround in a way that's a net positive for every single person that's involved, people will carry their own water to, to get there. Everyone will jump on board. If it's an opportunity to, to stop doing something that always bugged you, that you wish you didn't have to do anymore, or rebalance tasks or rebalance responsibilities, um, use a technology that you always thought was a good fit. Like, but you you really you 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 have to do it one at a time. You you win you mm -hmm. win people over as as individuals, and that's ultimately what what creates that culture of, of energy. It's everyone showing up to do that every day. Wonderful. Thanks for taking us through this presentation, Rob. Interesting perspective. And once again, appreciate your time for participating in uh, API Days. Thank again, you. Thank, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Wonderful.